And most people would just say, Jesus, you should have done that a long time ago, you moron. And But then you go do it. Harry Potter, for example, which I'm making reference to because it was such a phenomenon. I mean, when, when, when something makes a welfare mother richer than the Queen of England, you shouldn't take note, right? And, and when, when kids are reading 500-page books and, and, and standing in line waiting for the next one, and when you produce a whole movie empire around something, you should take note of that. Well, Harry Potter's little team aren't the delinquents, right, who have no discipline, but they're also not the good kids. They're the kids who will break rules when necessary, and that's, that's the issue. Break rules when necessary. Now, the question is, when is that necessary? Well, that's sort of the ultimate, ultimate ethical choice. The rules of the game are well established, and then if you play it properly, you get to win. And that's a big deal as well. But I also think that, and this, this is part of the reason that I'm an admirer of Carl Jung, because Jung makes it very clear that, see, he was very interested in the barriers to enlightenment. Because if there's, a, if there's such a thing as being enlightened, let's say, then why isn't everyone enlightened? If it's just a matter of, t of taking the, the glorious um, um, route and, and following your bliss, let's say, it's like, well, that sounds pretty easy. Why isn't everyone enlightened? And, but Jung's thinking isn't like that at all. You know, he, he believed that in order to transform your personality, that first of all, you had to be disciplined, that's for sure. But you also had to integrate that part of you that was terrible and capable of breaking rules and make it part of you. And so then, and I really like that idea. And so you, you know, in, again in the Harry Potter stories, you see he's touched by evil, right? He he actually has a soul fragment that's embedded within him that's as black as anything can possibly be. That's why he can talk to snakes. But without that, he wouldn't be able to have any victory. And that's exactly right psychologically. Unless you can think the way that an evil person thinks, then you're defenseless against them because they'll go places you can't imagine and then they win. And so the best men I've met, I, it was interesting even when I was in junior high and high school because most of my friends dropped out, you know, by the time they're grade 10, thereabouts. And a lot of them were guys who developed physically, they're pretty powerful and they're just damn sick of putting up their hand to go to the bathroom. It's like, you know, they're not doing that anymore. One of my friends got kicked out when he sort of challenged the gym teacher, you know, physically. And, the gym teacher, he could do an iron cross. He was a tough guy, and so it was no trivial matter for my friend to stand up to him, but he got expelled anyways. But, you know, I noticed that it wasn't... It, it was often the kids whose character I admired that either quit or got expelled, and they were the tougher guys who were just sick and tired of following rules that didn't take into account their character, and then they'd go off and work in the oil rigs or whatever, and you could do that in Alberta at that time. That was really hard work, you know? So it wasn't like they were necessarily taking the easy path. But, like, a harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very, very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. And, you know, you also see that, um, like, one of the central <clears throat> female stories, let's say, um, if the hero archetype is the central male story. There are variants of hero archetypes that are relevant to women, and one of them is Beauty and the Beast. And, you know, Beauty isn't interested in the guy who isn't the beast. She's interested in the guy who's the beast, and that's exactly right, but he, she's interested in the guy who's the beast that can be civilized and disciplined, right, and who can use that in the service, well, let's say, of a family. And, and that's exactly, well, that's exactly how it should be. It's better to act it out and to understand it. You know, that's, that's best. It's better, it's better to understand it and not act it out than to not understand it at all. But the best is to act it out and understand it. Because then you can, you know, then, then the way that you represent the world and yourself is in accordance with the way that you act. And that's, that's, that's optimized. Because first of all, you learn that truth is relevant, relative and that there's no real moral order. And, you know, that alleviates you of responsibility. And that's why that's such an attractive message to people. But the problem is, is that it kills you. It kills your soul, so to speak, because, well, when we can talk about this technically. So, you know, there are systems, neurological systems that underlie your experience of negative emotion. And there are neurological systems that underlie your experience of positive emotion. And they're separate systems. They obviously interact, but they're separate systems. So. But the positive emotion system, well, there's two of them, but one of them sort of kicks in when you get something that you want. So, you know, you're hungry and you eat and that feels good. And so that's kind of the simple one. Um, 
but there's a more sophisticated one that I think is even more active in people. Um, and it's the one that tells you that you're moving forward towards something worthwhile. And that's actually the one that gives people that sense of in meaningful engagement in their life on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So, and, and it's, also, it's also something that doesn't have to go away. Like, if you're hungry and you eat, well, that's good. But it's over, and then you're on to the next thing, right? It, it's not exactly sustaining, it's just necessary. That's called consumatory reward, by the way. This other reward system is incentive reward. And the incentive reward system works on dopamine, this neurochemical dopamine, which is also the, the neurochemical tracks that opiates and cocaine and amphetamines, the drugs that people really like to abuse, alcohol often for some people, um, activate. And so you might say if you don't have enough meaning in your life, then you're more prone to addiction. And that's definitely the case, even with rats. If you take a rat and you put him in a cage by himself and he has nothing to do, and then you give him access to cocaine, he'll get addicted to the point where he won't do anything but take cocaine. But if you throw the rat back in with a bunch of other rats and he gets to do rat things, then it's very hard to get him addicted to cocaine. And so the purposeless rat is prone to addiction. Well, it's the same with human beings. Now, here's a corollary to that, which is really cool. So the magnitude of the reward you experience as you're moving towards a goal is proportionate to the importance of the goal. So that means the more important the goal you pick, the more possibility there is for the kind of reward, let's say, it's really a state of being that is life affirming. And it is directly life affirming in that, you know, like if you're in a football game and, you're, and it's an important football game and maybe you break a finger and you know, normally that's, that's a problem, it hurts, and you're going to stop doing whatever you're doing, but if you're right in the middle of the game, then you'll be so amped up on this reward system that it's analgesic, it stops the pain, it also suppresses anxiety. So, if you have a purpose, then it's analgesic, it, it takes some of the pain out of life, it's very positive in that it motivates and energizes you and focuses you and makes you able to remember and, and pay attention, and it, it quells fear. And so those things are all direct. And so then you might think, well, what's the best possible goal? Well, and that's, that's the purpose, I would say, of religious training and philosophical training. It's like, just what the hell are you doing in the world? You know, and I would say, well, that's actually fairly easy to also, um, to also lay out. And this is why nihilism is a much weaker philosophical position than it might appear to be. It's like, well, there are lots of terrible things happening in the world. If you're not, I don't care if you're a believer, an atheist, or, or a cynic of the highest sort. So you might say, well, at least you can start your self-organization by improving those things around you that are self-evidently not good. And that's easy, man. Anybody can do this. You can sit down for 10 minutes, say, well, I'm going to be honest with myself. Like, oh, that's a horrible thing to do. I'm going to be honest with myself. Okay, I'm probably doing a dozen stupid things that I could quit doing that are making my life less, more wretched, and also the people around me. And so you think, okay, what are those things? And you know, if you really want to know, you have to want to know. And you're going to get a bunch of information that you don't want to hear, but you'll know it's true, and you already knew it in some sense. And then you can ask yourself, okay, that sucks, and it's miserable, and it's not very self-affirming. Um, is there one of those things I would, I would be willing to do something about, that I would actually do something about, you know? That I could do something about, that I would do something about? Which is also another horrible question, because as soon as you get an answer to that, then you have a responsibility, right? It's like, oh God, I have to go do that. And it's something you don't want to do. You don't want to do it. That's why you've been avoiding it. And so, then it's right in front of you. And it's like it's some little trivial, horrible thing that you're not going to get a pat on the back for, and no one's going to give you an award for it. And, and most people would just say, Jesus, you should have done that a long time ago, you moron. And you think, okay, what kind of moron am I? And what stupid things am I doing? And then, what could I possibly do to get rid of one of those a little bit now? Well. Anybody can do that. You're improving your character and you're constraining the kinds of actions and perceptions that you have that are going to make you sick of life and work against it. Because failure does that. Keep screwing up, man. See what happens. If you think that isn't going to make you bitter, and if that isn't going to make you vengeful, and if that isn't going to make you work to hurt people around you, or at least not to help them, which is the same thing, then 
you're just not paying attention. Everyone knows that's true. 